Welcome everybody um, joining from either Europe or the United States this afternoon or morning. Um, my name is Teresa Ida. I run the Foreign and Security Policy Program at the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Washington, DC. And I will moderate today's very timely discussion about how the EU can um, approach an isolationist America. Um, before we get started with the actual discussions, a few preliminaries up front. Our webinar today is recorded um, and we'll have only about an hour, um, and, but there will be time for questions from the audience. So if you have a question for the panelists, uh, please use the Q&A box and we will get to those at the end of the session. Um, we are fortunate to have with us the president of the Heinrich Böll Foundation today, Jan Philipp Albrecht. And he will say a few opening remarks to help us frame this discussion. So I'm turning it over to you, Jan Philipp Albrecht. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you for having me. I'm uh, in between two meetings. I'm sorry for the noise. Um, welcome to everybody here. I'm very happy that we have uh, uh, around 100 registrations uh, to this event. And I would say uh, the event is really timely. Uh, as we are right after um, a Munich Security Conference uh, uh, in which it was very obvious that uh, one of the big questions, of course, is how will we deal uh, with uh, a situation in NATO where uh, a possible next US president uh, might uh, question uh, the necessities uh, which come with the alliance, especially the protection guarantees, the security guarantees uh, from the US um, to uh, European partners. And that, of course, in a moment where we see with the Russian war uh, of aggression against uh, Ukraine now after two years uh, is still um, uh, unfolding. And uh, the question again comes up uh, on how long Ukraine will be able to um, defend itself uh, in the way they have been managing until here and um, where the question of uh, further support and also long-term perspective uh, for this as it is not going to be finished uh, in a very short time um, is on the table. And I'm very happy that we have uh, also a common paper uh, on this just published uh, where it is about the question, how we, do we deal with a next uh, Trump administration when it comes up? Um, and uh, how do we um, deal with the necessity of the Europeans also develop, developing their own security uh, guarantees in light of all these challenges? And we just had our own foreign and security conference uh, in Berlin of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. And it was really interesting to see uh, how uh, heavy this debate is going to be. Uh, as we see, of course, that uh, the European Union, for ex uh, example, in its capacity to uh, manage its own security uh, framework is not really in place to uh, deliver for further solutions. And we see European partners now only starting uh, to look for further arrangements and agreements between individual uh, member states of the European Union. And this all um, happens to be uh, very complicated. And I'm very thankful, therefore, that we have uh, this uh, round of exchange today. And I'm thankful for you, Teresa, to uh, uh, to bring together the different perspectives which we have um, gathered here in this uh, room. And I'm happy to follow uh, uh, also the talk. Thanks for being here and uh, thanks for coming together on this very important question. Thank you, Jan, uh, for your remarks. And as Jan noted, um, this is a highly consequential moment. Um, the US election is on everyone's mind but I would argue that we are already navigating very turbulent waters. And a uh, few things that I that highlight that in my view are obviously the Trump comment um, that he gave recently that is sort of almost an assault on our Article 5. Um, we still haven't seen another US uh, package for Ukraine in the Congress. So we've been waiting for that. Um, and Russia just this past weekend conquered the town of Avdivka, 
um, the first major gain since May 2023. So there are all these things happening already right now, um, which just speak to the urgency of this moment. Um, I would like to actually ask our audience um, uh, a quick question, uh, just a yes and no poll um, to see where the room sort of stands on this topic. Um, and I think you should all see this in, in a minute or less than a minute. We'll just be open. It will be open for a couple seconds. So the question is, is Europe ready for a Trump 2.0 US presidency? Okay. Skip it for a couple more seconds. Okay. I'm curious about the answer. Oh, wow. That's, um, uh, I mean, I don't know who manipulated this poll, but 100% uh, goes to no, Europe is not ready for a Trump 2.0 presidency. I think that's uh, a sign for me that we need to discuss this a lot more. Um, and to help us make sense of all these uh, recent developments, I'm very happy to have Max Bergman, Jana Puglerin, and Stephen Everts with, Everts with me. Um, and I'd like to introduce all of them briefly. Um, Max Bergman is the director of the Europe, Russia, and Eurasia program and the Stewart Center in Euro-Atlantic and Northern European Studies at CSIS, so the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, and prior to joining CSIS, he worked at the Center for American Progress, where he also focused on Europe, Russia, and U.S. security cooperation. And from 2011 to 2017, he served in the U.S. Department of State in a number of senior positions, including as a member of the Secretary of State's policy planning staff. Um, Jana Puglarin is a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations, and she also heads their Berlin office since January 2020. She also directs the ECFR's Reshape Global Europe project, which seeks to develop new strategies for Europeans to understand and engage with the changing international order. Um, before that, she headed the Alfred von Oppenheim Center for European Policy Studies at the DGAP, the German Council on Foreign Relations. And uh, last but not least, Stephen Everts. He's the director of the EU Institute for Security Studies, which is the EU's agency dealing with the analysis of foreign security and defense policy issues. Um, the core mission is to assist the EU and its member states with the implementation of the Common Foreign and Security Policy the CFSP, including the common security and defense policy, as well as other external action on the union. And prior to joining EUISS, Stephen served in the European External Action Service in several senior roles, including as senior advisor to the VP on strategy and communications and in the Asia Pacific department. So thank you very much for taking the time out of what I think was a very, is a very busy, I'm sure you have a very busy schedule right now. Um, we just, you know, followed the Munich Security Conference. Some of you were there in person. Um, and so um, everything that I've seen and read and heard about the Munich Security Conference, obviously um, a looming possible Trump presidency was in the back of everybody's mind there. Um, but sort of before we get into the actual question that we want to answer today, how can Europe deal with an isolationist um, American administration. Um, I would sort of want to start um, take, um, start with the stakes. What is at stake here? Um, and I would like to start with you, Max. Um, you wrote this terrific paper um, for us about another Trump administration, what it would mean for Europe. Um, the audience can see it in the chat and I encourage everybody to read it because there's a lot in there. So um, I would like to ask you, can you help us understand how would a Trump 2.0 administration differ from the first one? And sort of what are the implications from a US perspective um, for transatlantic relations? Great, uh, well, well, thank you, Teresa. And thanks to the Bull Foundation for uh, for prompting me to, to write this paper and for, for working uh, with me and CSIS on, on getting it uh, over the line. 
it's also great to be uh, with Stephen and with with Yana and Jan Philippe as well. Um, let, let me just start by saying when Trump won in 2016, it was a shock to everyone, including Trump himself. Uh, if you kind of go back and, and remove the cobwebs and remember after Trump won, it was actually Governor Chris Christie that had been sort of nominally in charge of the Trump transition and then was quickly ceremonially fired um, uh, by Jared Kushner. And I say that because it was total chaos during the transition. As someone in the Obama administration, uh, uh, you know, ready to kind of hand off portfolios to incoming Trump folks, there was no meeting that was ever had. Uh, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson actually never met with Secretary of State John Kerry, uh, kind of unprecedented in the in how discombobulated this transition was. And the reason why is because Trump had no plan. There was no plan for how he was going to govern, of who was going to take what jobs and what positions. Um, and so it was chaos. And, and in fact, I think that chaos ended actually uh, ended up actually being quite positive uh, in in many respects, because it meant that uh, Trump didn't have a deep bench of people. It meant that uh, there hadn't flushed out detailed policy positions on how they were going to approach NATO and European security and all these other issues. Uh, and so when you saw people like uh, 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 Jim Mattis become Secretary of Defense and later Mark Esper, you had a lot of sort of traditional American foreign policy hands actually take the reins. Um, and you also had a very inexperienced Trump administration of how to deal with the U.S. government. All of that's very different this time. Uh, Trump, uh, I think, in many of Trump's people felt that they were very they were thwarted by many of the appointees in the Trump administration uh, that didn't adhere or uh, believe in what Trump was uh, are, uh, advocating. For instance, when Trump called for troops to be pulled out of Germany, basically the Secretary of Defense Mark Esper didn't do it. Uh, and I think what you're going to be looking at is a situation where that's not the case now. You will have a much more alignment between um, the political appointees in the administration and the administration itself. Uh, you will also see, I think, an effort by the Trump administration to bring the civil service to heal the so-called deep state that Trump and, and his supporters went on and on about. And there's talk about essentially you know, uh, civil service reform, which is being able to fire civil servants at will, which will mean there's not going to be a lot of uh, blockage uh, of action uh, within within the civil uh, civil service, which means there'll be more implementation of what Trump wants. And then the last point, um, well, actually, one more, the Congress will actually be much more uh, amenable to what Trump is advocating. We forget that there was a re total Republican control in 2017 and 2018 in the Congress. Uh, but yet that Republican Party was still very much of the kind of John McCain Republican Party. Lindsey Graham uh, was still not, uh, you know, a, a strong supporter of the Transatlantic Alliance, even, even though if he still claims to be today. But uh, it was the Republican Congress that put in place Russia sanctions in May of 2017 after James Comey was fired. Uh, and and so they you saw Congress acting as a check on Trump's anti transatlanticist uh, inclinations, increasing funding for the European uh, um, uh, Deterrence Initiative, which was US funding, uh, US uh, supported US force presence in Europe. But now, if, there, if Trump wins, I think it's likely that Trump would have total control of, the, of Congress and that Congress uh, uh, would be very aligned with his views uh, and wouldn't serve as an obstacle and, in fact, serve as an enabler of Trump's actions. And you're seeing that right now on Capitol Hill with the division amongst the Republican Party about how to proceed on, on Ukraine. And the momentum is unfortunately not with the pro-Ukraine, pro-transatlantic side inside of the Republican Party, because Trump is like likely the nominee. And I think that will very much continue um, if, if Trump uh, becomes president. I think they'll, the Republicans in Congress will essentially get in line. So this leads to the last kind of I think scary point if you're a transatlanticist is that there's an agenda. There's a plan being developed. There are think tanks and other organizations affiliated or tied with uh, with President Trump. Now it's never clear about how much actual influence they will have once Trump govern or once Trump uh, assumes the presidency, assuming he does. And I do not think that's a, uh, a, a um, uh, I don't think we should assume that. 
But a lot of these plans call for basically a U.S. Uh, withdrawal from NATO. Now, Congress has just passed um, uh, legislation that will require the Senate to have a two-thirds vote to formally pull the United States out of NATO. But I think that sort of could make Europe feel good, but actually won't matter. Because, look, the president doesn't have to appoint a Supreme Allied commander. He doesn't have to appoint an ambassador to NATO. Uh, he doesn't have to go to any of these NATO summits. He doesn't have to deploy U.S. forces uh, uh, to, to, to Europe. He can uh, completely undermine the U.S. position in NATO. And what we've seen, I think, from Trump's comments uh, 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 earlier or, uh, last week is that Trump has no affinity for European security and for the transatlantic alliance. And I think it is a deep mistake when many Europeans say, well, if, if we all just spent 2% and sort of paid our dues and sort of buy into the logic of that this is essentially pay to play scheme, um, that that will solve their security problem. No, I don't think that's the case at all. The 2% is code. It is not that we want Europe to just spend a little bit more and provide European capabilities to US led NATO operations. It is code for we want Europe to take control of its own security. That is how I think Trump and many Republicans and many Democrats as well think about 2%. And the problem is that it would be great if Europe could just spend 2% and that would solve its defense issues. But that's a total illusion. European defense revolves around the United States uh, acting as the guarantor of European security. Right now, you can't do European security. You do national security and we do European security. That is the bargain that Trump and many others in America are uh, had it with. And I think that the problem is that Trump could pull the rug out from under Europe um, without Europe being ready to sort of step in. So maybe I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Max. I mean, um, the picture you're painting is um, not does, doesn't contain any positive elements. Let's put it this way. Um, I would like to turn to Jana. Um, you were just at the Munich Security Conference. Um, could you maybe take us behind the scenes and sort of help us understand how the Europeans are looking at the implications of a second Trump administration right now? Has there been sort of this wake up call um, after the and, you know, after the primaries, seeing that Trump has a real chance to become the can, well, he will be the candidate. I think that's, uh, we can say that, but um, that he also has a chance to win back the presidency. And how do Europeans look at that? So at the Munich Security Conference, it was a bit like in a European fairy tale about an emperor in new clothes. I don't know if you know that in the United States um, as well, it is basically an emperor who is who, who gets um, told that there are these fantastic clothes which are fake and he is standing there naked, but he thinks that he has these uh, clothes on and his advisors keep on telling him how fantastic he looks and how great everything is while the broader population starts mumbling and kind of telling each other, well, he's naked. And then in the end, he's kind of revealed as naked. And a bit like that was the Munich Security Conference. You had the big stages, you had the big messages, you had Kamala Harris giving a um, strong speech on how important transatlantic relations are, um, how much the United States um, value alliances um you and and then you had Anthony Blinken starting his whole intervention by saying how important alliances are for America you had senators also from the Republican um side are saying no 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 uh we will be engaged in Europe um don't worry and then the quote I've heard most I think I've heard it at least from three different Americans but maybe more even four is that America does the right thing after it has exhausted all other possibilities. So it was basically a message to Europeans, we got you covered, we, we will be there, it's difficult at the moment, but trust us, we will solve this somehow. But behind the scenes, in the corridors, in bilats, but also in kind of smaller round tables, off the record, especially the American participants were very frank and very open and said, well, you know, um, this time 
it's for real. I mean, we have been talking about you taking over responsibility for Europe, for European security for a long time. We started at, at least uh, with the Obama administration, but this time it's really, um, it's your last call. Um, either you, you listen to it now or we cannot guarantee for anything. And I think the Europeans are beyond, um, I don't know, be, beyond those people admiring the beautiful clothes. I think most Europeans sat in the audience with the public speeches and were like, something is wrong here. Uh, we don't believe that this is going to happen. And there is, I think there was a new sense of urgency amongst Europeans. Um, I think the whole speech that Chancellor Scholz gave was an attempt to demonstrate leadership in Europe and to encourage or call on the other European countries, especially those um, west of us, to do more, actually to do like Germany does, <laughs> because um, Germany was praised for being the second largest contributor to Ukraine quite, quite often by the Chancellor and other German representatives. Um, so I think there is this sense of urgency, but coming to the double standards again and to the diverging messages from big stages and kind of small background conversations on stage, there was a lot of, yes, we have understood it, uh, we need to do more, uh, we know this is serious, but in smaller conversations, there was a lot of desperation, a lot of cluelessness. So we are working on this for two decades now. Um, we have had so many wake up calls. How can we finally, finally make it work? Um, there is, there are all sorts of ideas, but there then there are so many obstacles. But I think that the situation is serious, has really sunken in. I think there are only few Europeans, at least at the Munich Security Conference, those that I have met, that um, basically have argued, well, uh, when Trump was there um, in his first term, it wasn't that bad after all. Um, there is like, don't listen to what he says, look what he does, or kind of the old phrases that we heard in the first um, term. Not, not much of that any longer. Um, I think most people realize that first and foremost, there's going to be a domestic transformation. I think people in Europe, and that maybe that's my last point of I mean, there, there was a lot of talk about the dormant NATO concept and the United States withdrawing from NATO or kind of undermining NATO credibility. There was a lot of concern about a Minsk III uh, arrangement, something that could come from a Trump administration. But there was also, I think, a deep concern about the United States becoming an illiberal democracy or kind of be turning into an Orbanish state and what that would mean also for our democracies and for for yeah so it was a, a, a lot of what max has just explained i think is what what europeans fear most mm -hmm. um i think max you also touched briefly on sort of the um security setup uh you know the the Americans are doing European security, but the Europeans are basically just doing national security. And with that, sort of, I wanted to turn to Stephen to maybe elaborate a little bit more, you know, what are the implications for European defense and security um, if there were to be uh, another Trump administration? And even at this point, I would, I would argue even right now, no matter if Trump gets elected or not, um, you know, we looking at, at the US Congress and waiting for this uh, package for Ukraine, if that doesn't come, what does it mean for Europe? Is Europe ready to um, stem the, 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 the really, you know, the big um, part um, of the security architecture? Can you unmute yourself? Thanks, uh, Teresa, and it's great uh, to be with uh, Jana and uh, Max to discuss this very, very serious issue. Um, I mean, Max began by saying there's a plan this time. It's different this time because there's a plan. And um, so I think Europe needs to be a plan, uh, have a plan, and we need to be ready uh, for this. So maybe if you allow me, I could perhaps sketch out with some do's and don'ts, or rather don'ts, uh, some axioms that Europe could perhaps employ to to deal with the storm that's, uh, that's seemingly uh, coming. I go very quickly, yeah? don't worry. First, don't be in denial. 
Um, I think Jana alluded to this, but I think there's still a degree of denial uh, in European policy circles, um, but it's it's receding um, and it's receding, I think, principally because the message that Max brought us uh, is sinking in, right? People are aware that there's a plan now, there are being people being ready, there's an agenda being laid out and a number of the constraints that were there in Trump 1.0 won't be there to save us in Trump uh, 2.0. But that's an important starting point. Don't be in denial. Secondly, I don't think we should reduce this to the EU, NATO, security, Ukraine, Minsk, uh, abandonment of a uh, issue. I think there's a much broader challenge because Trump 2.0, Trump unleashed, uh, Trump that will be implemented, will be a massive headache for Europeans um, across the policy agenda. If you look at uh, trade, where there's talk of uh, tariffs across the board, if you look at climate, you know this will be a huge uh, step back uh, from the return of the US to the global climate negotiations that we've seen uh, on, on, on democracy. Jana was right. I mean, uh, this sort of illiberal... Uh, coalition, this trade union of, of authoritarian uh, forces, this could be a big, big headache also within uh, the European Union. So third, the, it's the second, don't reduce it to security. It's important, but don't reduce it. Third, don't bilateralize this too much. Already we see tendencies, I think, in Washington where people are trying to sort of get into the good books. Um, and I think if Trump is indeed elected, we can sort of uh, get a a rush to the White House, uh, you know, uh, to kiss the ring um, of the emperor and and tr an attempt. And I think it will be futile. It will Trump will rightly see it as weakness. Um, but I think that that we need, therefore, a sort of a common script. A com we need to invest now in that common set of messages and also a choreography. Who is going to be the first person to go on behalf of Europe? Uh, to the White House, who is that person? Is one of the reasons why I really hope we're going to have a heavyweight as European Council President, because this is one of the big, big tasks that I think this person uh, will will need to uh, uh, conduct. Fourth, uh, don't forget we have allies in this. We're not alone. This is not a Europe alone moment. You hear this sometimes, right? We're being in this world of threats and big uh, challenges, and Europe is alone. I don't think we are alone. The predicament that we will face with Trump is not a predicament we face alone. There was going to be Canada, Australia, Japan, South Korea, and beyond. There will be a large number of countries that will have a similar problem to us. And in life, if you have a problem that is shared, it's a problem that is halved. So I think we need to already also invest in those kinds of alliances, as well as investing in uh, broader forces inside the United States. Max knows better than me. U.S. is a big place. Uh, we do have assets. Uh, we do have relationships. We do have things that we can mobilize and uh, and draw on. We're not alone. Uh, fourth, uh, no, fifth. We're already at the fifth point. Uh, don't count out Biden. I know we're sort of all gearing up for this, and this is also a little bit the framing of, of today's uh, discussion, but it is possible that somehow Joe wins, uh, and we got to have a plan for that uh, uh, as well. We'll not be short of uh, challenges either, but a challenge of a different magnitude and a different order, uh, of course, but I think it's, 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 uh, it's worth uh, reserving a little bit of mental capacity for that uh, eventuality as well. Back to you, Teresa. Thanks. Thank you. And Stephen, uh, also for this very tangible, um, you know, advice of what the Europeans should do. Um, let me turn it back to Max, because you also mentioned a few of uh, the sort of approaches that Europe should think about when engaging with the US. So maybe you can elaborate or add to what Stephen just said. Yeah, actually, let me just pick up on something Stephen said. I think there is, I think there's a European presumption now that Trump is definitely going to win. I think American elections are always very close. They'll likely be a very close election. But the polling right now with, is very even. And a lot of it, I think, indicates that Democratic, a lot of when you see Biden's low numbers, it's Democrats sort of wish casting there's a different candidate. And when faced with a, a choice, if I think very unlikely that they vote for Trump. Now, a lot will come down to turnout and other things. But I don't think Europeans should presume that Donald Trump will be the next president. I do think, as Stephen meant, 
uh, mentions, it's very good for Europe to also have a plan. And I think many of the steps that Europe should take um, to prepare for a Trump administration are also things that they would want to do, I think, regardless, because it's ultimately about strengthening Europe. So I think, number one, uh, I think Stephen hits on it, that one of the biggest challenges will, will be for Europe to be united uh, in how they approach uh, the United States and how they approach Washington. Um, and what we saw from the first Trump administration was an effort to engage with like-minded individuals. So he his first trip to Europe was to Poland, uh, and there was a lot of engagement with Viktor Orban's Hungary. Uh, and I, I, I think the question for Europe is who has a rapport with the president? And does that European that has a rapport with the president, can they speak for Europe? Um, when I look back at the tr first Trump administration, I think one interesting aspect is I actually think the EU uh, was quite strong in how it dealt with the Trump administration. There was a there was a trade war where the U.S. put in place tariffs. And how did you, the EU respond? Not by sort of slinking back uh, and, and groveling, please, please don't tariff us. The commission was all excited. You know, we'll punch you back. And they did tariffs on on motorcycles and and uh, and um, Lee jeans and and God forbid our uh, American bourbon as well, uh, and and Jean Claude Juncker came to the White House. It was actually a fairly I think prominent moment for the e, for an EU Commission president to come to the White House, and Juncker didn't come sort of in a feeble manner, but came and sort of gave as good as he was getting, and Trump respected that. Now, whether he Trump has the same rapport with the next European uh, Commission president, whether that's Ursula von der Leyen or someone else, I don't know. But I think what's important here is that Americans think of Europe as weak and feckless that are just trying to kind of buy our love by buying American weapons and and are you know constantly groveling about how are constantly sort of expressing their commitment to the alliance and how important it is for America to remain committed. But oftentimes we take Europe for granted then, and we don't think of Europe as being important. So the, I think the most important thing is for Europe to demonstrate its strength. Um, and so I would think, you know, are there interlocutors that could have a relationship with Trump and speak for the EU? In the, in the paper, I highlighted Georgia Maloney. I think that probably would draw a lot of uh, heart, heart palpitations across Europe. And maybe that's the case. And maybe Maloney doesn't have that trust, but maybe it's Macron, maybe it's someone else. But I think that's where figuring out, is there a European interlocutor that Trump uh, can respect? And also then staying united behind that European interlocutor, whether it's von der Leyen or another European leader. Um, I, and I also think that th this could be a moment for the EU to be to really shine. Trump respects the fact that the EU can do uh, um, uh, can invoke tariffs. And I think that's where uh, the EU can really demonstrate uh, its strength. And also, I think on China policy is one where Europe, um, the Brussels and the EU are a, a major interlocutor and actor in that. And this, the Biden administration has come to realize that. And I think a Trump administration would as well. Uh, when it comes to NATO, this is where I, I think it's just the, Trump has decided that he's anti-NATO. Um, and I think on the security side is much more concerning. And I think there, the argument I would make, um, or I think that Europeans will end up making as uh, uh is that look? Give us time. Uh, that we we hear you. We're you know defense spending has increased, but it will take us time to fully decouple. Don't pull out you know the the nuclear uh, assurances that you provide to the NATO alliance. Give us time to take control of European security, and maybe that has resonance. I don't know. I think if Trump, if 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 real action was demonstrated, I think that that could uh, that could move the needle. But all of this is not, it's going to be more of an art than a science. No one can say what will or will not work ahead of time. But the important thing is that I think, you know, Europe will need to most likely on the defense side begin to start thinking about how it can defend Europe uh, without a prominent U.S. role. And I think that's going to be the biggest challenge and buying time is probably the best that Europe can hope for there. Yana, do you want to answer to that? Um, yeah. I would like to comment on this with two points. Um, the first challenge I see for Europeans um, after a Trump victory, if Trump would start doing what he or what Max has explained at the beginning, undermining American democracy, is that it will be hard for European politicians 
in election campaigns to make the case for a continued transatlantic relationship. Um, it would be interest-based. So this, we can no longer talk about values. We can no longer talk about the transatlantic alliance as an alliance that is ba basically a good alliance because it's, yeah, it, it, it stands for the good in the world. Um, and I remember various election campaigns in Germany, uh, including um, one where basically the candidate uh, for chancellor for the SPD back then made it a slogan not to spend 2% for Donald Trump. I think the situation is different. We have a war next door or basically a war that is affecting uh, our security as well already um, and where we are hugely invested. So there is, I think, a, a different understanding, at least in the elites, that the United States is indispensable and that we need to work hard to do everything to keep the United States engaged on specific topics wherever possible. But I think with the public, uh, it's not that that easy to make that that claim. Maybe I'm too Germany uh, centered here and in Central and Eastern Europe might be much easier. Oh, for sure will be much easier because they see the direct threat uh, of their security in my country. But I think also in other uh, societies, it, it will be harder to make um, the case for also making concessions um, or kind of to, to bribe basically uh, a, a Trump administration um, and, and to do nasty things that we don't want to do just to please them. So that's the first point. And the second point is that I'm generally more pessimistic than Maxis when it comes to the Trump administration, or a possible, I mean, there is no second Trump administration yet, but a possible second Trump administration's ability to realize or to recognize alliances as um, being something that is not a, a liability, but an asset. Because I think, especially, for example, when it comes to China, the Biden uh, administration has early on understood that they wanted to work with Europe. They saw Europe as um, an asset. Um, they thought we can bring Europe on board for our agenda and that makes us more powerful. I think the Trump approach is entirely hostile, not only vis-a-vis -vis NATO, but all multilateral processes, the concept of alliances that go beyond the transactional approach and so I'm not so sure if the Trump administration identifies Europe as a potential ally on China and would therefore spare us when it comes to, I don't know, tariffs or stuff. I think it will be more of a blackmailing approach, but no kind of gloves uh, looking or dealing with, with Europe. And so I think where we really, really, really need to do everything to keep the United States engaged is when it comes to nuclear deterrence, because this is just a huge, huge mess in Europe. We have some delusional debates about an EU nuclear deterrent, which I think is as far away as the moon from reality. So that is something where I think we should really, really be invested, but then also making sure that we can cover the conventional deterrence of Russia and forward defense ourselves. That should be an enormous focus because what I, how I read the, the papers that are floating around in Washington is that so far the nuclear extended deterrence is not something that is put out there as this, we put this in question, but it's more, we want not burden sharing, but burden shifting, and you need to be able to defend Europe, but it's more about conventional capabilities, I hope, but we'll see. Thank you, Jana. Um, I'm just, I uh, want to remind our audience, please put your questions into the Q&A box because we'll get to those soon. Jana, you already touched a little bit on it. Um, the fact that you know European governments vis-a-vis -vis their own publics will have a hard time to argue for a transatlantic uh, relationship or, or a strong transatlantic alliance. Um, and this is something that I thought a lot about is sort of what, what are the red lines for Europe there? Um, where are the red lines for the Europeans to say like, okay, this, this relationship doesn't work anymore for us and it's, it's, it's one-sided and we are, you know, basically at the mercy of the Americans doing X, Y, Z. Um, and so that 
one question is where are the red lines for the Europeans, but then also are they in a position to actually act on those red lines and call into question the transatlantic alliance as such? Um, I, I'll, I'd like to pose this question to everybody in the room, but um, yeah, maybe Stephen, if you want to take take a crack at this one. Well, let me have a go. Um, I think the core of the matter, it seems to me, is whether Trump, with all that it implies, will have a sort of coalescing effect where Europeans will get together and they will see what he does at home. They will see some of the things he's going to do towards Europe or elsewhere in the world and his approach to multilateralism. And will that have a sort of a coalescing effect or will it have a, a dividing effect? Because, you know, the trust amongst us is not strong enough and the temptation to uh, to go it alone will be too strong. And I think that uh, that that's really sort of the the heart of the matter. And I think it will be very hard to think in terms of red lines that we can sort of uh, collectively uh, enforce beyond really the absolute minimum of of you know security guarantees. So it was interesting. And when he played with that comment uh, last weekend, there was across the board a sort of a rejection of that across the political uh, spectrum uh, uh, in Europe. Look, I think the bottom line on the security front is that we have to do what we've been saying for the last 25 years uh, since Saint Malo, and there have been countless plans and proposals to build up the European pillar of NATO. And, and But let's be honest, we have sort of pushed this debate forward and forward and forward. And uh, I think that we run out of road now. And so Max's plea to go to Trump and say, give us time. I mean, this is it is really sort of the, the last moment uh, for us to to sort of get serious. And and there it comes, you know, will will that then translate? What, is, what are you talking about? Are you translating into extra defense? Pepe? People say extra defense spending. Very good. But do you spend, as is presently the case, 80 percent of your uh, defense expenditure in the U.S. market? Or do you start to prioritize European uh, uh, options uh, for that? Not easy, eh? because there's amongst us also uh, a trust a deficit and you know, uh, there, there are all sorts of obstacles amongst them. But I think those kinds of things will change. That needle will have to change. That percentage will have to then uh, 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 come down. Um, it will be one of the many. Things. The second thing, I think we have to think in terms of supporting Ukraine principally on European shoulders. I think that that should be a an assumption underpinning uh, uh, our policy uh, work. It's not the preferred scenario. We still hope that uh, before the elections, the package gets adopted and that beyond somehow or other. But I don't think it can be the, 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 the sort of default option. So we have to think in terms of how can Europeans make sure Ukraine succeeds, holds on uh, the front as, as at least as it is, and succeeds in the success of Ukraine defined as integrating it into the European Union and NATO or what's left of it uh, uh, after. So these are the kinds of things that we should really identify and articulate as doable and feasible things for Europeans to do. Thanks. Thank you. Max, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything Stephen outlined. Um, I think, look, um, I think on the red lines, I think will add up. Uh, the first, the re European reaction to, to Trump's first term, I found actually very shocking because it was basically an ostrich strategy where Germany and others just sort of put their head in the sand and were like, man, if we just wait four years, this will be over. Um, and and I think that's not going to be possible as for some of the reasons Yana mentioned, but I think uh, Trump working to sort of undermine U.S. position in NATO. I think climate is going to be a big deal, that if the U.S. pulls out of Paris again and rolls back a lot of the environmental regulation and some of the aspects of the Inflation Reduction Act, which is basically a big climate bill, uh, and also a trade war with Europe, um, and then democratic rollback within the United States if there are major issues. I think you add those four together, defense, climate, trade, and democratic rollback, and you start seeing the contours of a, of a deeper rift where Europe is like, we can't handle this. And I, and I think, I guess I'm probably mo the more, most optimistic about the potential that Europe has than probably any European. Um, because look, this, there's a sort of defeatism about, oh, this is impossible. 
you know, how can we ever figure out how to kind of organize our defense? And then I look at Europe and you somehow have integrated how you handled international trade issues and all these other aspects that, you know, basically the EU has solved many of these uh, intense, intensely challenging um, uh, uh, sectors. Yet defense has just sort of been left out of it in the last 25 years, in part because the United States has not wanted you to integrate on defense. And I think there's would be a lot of momentum. And when I look at European public polling, and there's 80% or support of, of EU defense efforts, I think that gets interpreted as, well, the Euro public doesn't know what they're talking about. And if you really got in the weeds, you would they would be they would react. I, I come at that very differently and say the public is not ever going to get in the weeds. And what they are telling you is they want defense to be solved. They recognize their military suck and they want Europe to figure out a way to make this stronger. And there's a permissive environment for European leaders to lead and develop solutions here in a way that I think is I think is really being missed and that there's a lot of bureaucracy and other challenges Every country has their own defense industrial complexes. It's more of a bureaucratic challenge in Europe, I, the way I see it, and a funding challenge. But really, it's more figuring out the bureaucracy. Uh, and, and then I think Europe would figure out a way on defense. So I'm fairly optimistic that if there is, that Europe would react and defend its union in a very strong way, as we've seen countless times uh, before, especially over the last decade. Thank you, Max. Um, so before we go to the uh, to the audience question that we have, and I think both of them are sort of directed more to Max, um, I, I wanted to zoom out and uh, because nothing, none of this is happening in a vacuum. And China and Russia are likely going to be the beneficiaries of uh, eroding ties in the transatlantic relationships. Um, so I'd like to hear from all of you, and maybe you can just keep it very short. Um, what do what you think the second order effects of diminished U.S. engagement would be on Russia and China's foreign, pol uh, foreign policy decision making? Uh, maybe I'll start. I mean, that's a big question. I, I think like, look, I think the broader problem for Europe is that European security has not been threatened like this since the Cold War. Um, and I think what we see with the Russia-China relationship, well, I wouldn't call it an alliance. I do think that there is um, is a, a de facto partnership and one that is quite beneficial to China if China is causing uh, U.S. forces to be planted in Europe and that Europeans uh, to be uh, on, on edge. Uh, and so I, I, you know, I think there is a chance that Putin uh, may... Can, especially now a rearmed Russia, if it is able to continue to to do well in the war against Ukraine, maybe not win it, but if it, but it's building up its defense capacities, or will continue to sort of build up its defense capacities over the over this decade. And I I think I think Putin would like to challenge the European security architecture. So that relationship I think is quite uh, con concerning. And, and particularly if there's a war between China and the United States, which I don't think will happen, but if there is, I think Putin would seek to exploit that. And China would hope that he would seek to exploit that and cause a broader conflagration that would um, distract Europe and the United States. I can go next, um, but I think this, I haven't thought about this beyond uh, Europe that much. So um, I think there is more, but I'll stick to Europe. I think. What people are already talking about is that Russia is able to rebuild its military forces much quicker than a lot of analysts have thought, and that we have five to seven years until Russia is able to attack, or theoretically to attack Europe. Some Russia experts I talked to have said this is illusionary um, and Russia has no intention to do this. But fast forward kind of, I don't know, two years after Trump uh, got elected has demonstrated at several occasions um, that he's not interested in Europe and not really willing to defend it. I would not exclude such a situation that kind of there could be an attack on NATO territory and that Putin could be tempted to, to test our resolve, uh, maybe not um, an all, um, all in uh, military intervention, more uh, kind of gray zone activities, but but that is 
of course, kind of second order consequence could be that kind of, yeah. I think when it comes to Europe's periphery, um, the problem is not only about territorial defense, it's also that the US army is the backbone um, for uh, Europeans to be effective in military missions. We have seen this in Afghanistan, but also, yeah, um, kind of counterterrorism operations more broadly. Um, the United States is in the possession of so-called strategic enablers or is just more capable of collecting intelligence um, and has tools that the Europeans don't. Um, we've seen this in Libya quite impressively that the Europeans wanted to do something and could survive basically three days and that the United States then had to come to their rescue. So I think it will, would have an effect on um, also Europe's ability to do crisis management. It would, I think, encourage the further emergence of the axis of the sanctioned or like, I think already what you see is a strengthened Iran, a strengthened um, North Korea and the, the that kind of those countries increasingly collaborate openly with Russia, you see the further erosion of the so-called rules-based order. So um, the further undermining of laws and standards and rule of law uh, globally, um, the hollowing out of international institutions. Um, yeah, so for, for Europe, this is basically Europe that is based on a win-win uh, assumption of the world kind of cooperation is good for everybody and the cake uh, gets bigger and Europe that is under the assumption that rules or rule of law triumphs military might. Uh, I think this is just a nightmare scenario for us. So um, we are Hi. almost at time, but I wanted to give Stephen a quick, uh, the chance to, to answer that. And then I have one last question for all of you that you can answer very quickly. Okay, rap very rapidly. Um, on the second order consequence, to expand yeah. on what Jana and, and Max started to say about uh, principally European security, European theater, and 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 the wider mm -hmm. periphery. I think globally there would be two very important negative consequences for a uh, a Trump administration, um, and and this it basically would create greater space for principally China in partnership with Russia or China on itself to really uh, make a lot of headway with um, its campaign to reshape norms around technology and trade and cyber and, and, and that whole domain, because it is a domain in which the present US administration working closely with the European Union and other like-minded partners is very active. And a US that disengages from that field gives a lot more space to China uh, to really dominate and prevail in uh, in that domain. So that's that's a global second order consequence that I take very seriously. And then related to that, and uh, the second example is sort of the whole clearly human rights, the standards of democracy, but even sort of the the image of the strong man, uh, the quality of 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 how countries are uh, are run. Uh, that would be you know receiving a massive. Uh, setback um, and it will give a lot of more space and political wind in the sails of of more authoritarian people around the world um, so that that these are the second order effects that I take very very seriously and in that sense I started off by saying Europe is not alone but in that sense it would start to feel a little bit that in that respect you would start to be not alone but become a strategic minority uh, and that changes the game thank you I need to run in a second. I'm, I apologize in advance. Okay. So then um, maybe I'll start with you, Stephen. Um, I just wanted to ask all of you, what is the most important thing that the EU should do in view of a changing transatlantic relationship? And One sentence, invest in unity. We all proclaim that we want unity, but we want unity on our terms. Um, and unity is something that cannot happen 100% on the basis of what you want as your country or your political faction or, or what have you. So we all need to you know, see the gains, the strategic gains that we get collectively if we are united. Um, and, and we can send people into uh, the White House to hold our ground, to negotiate with Trump, to push back where necessary or develop alternatives. But you need to invest in it. It cannot happen 100% on your terms alone. Thank you, Stephen. 
Um, Jana, what would you say is the most important thing? I agree with Stephen, unity, and I would add capabilities, military capabilities, because that is the one area where we are so dependent on the United States, particularly for our basically so many countries, especially on the eastern flank, have the impression that they are dependent on the US for their sheer survival, for their existence. So I think if we would be able as Europeans to guarantee our the security of Europe, kind of territorial security, um, that would give us more room for maneuver and would make us less vulnerable to blackmail. So unity and capabilities. Thank you. And Max, you have the last word. Well, I think they, they, they stole the two that I was going to go with. So maybe I'll go with a, a third, which is money. <laughs> um, what, what, so I, I think a little bit is too much made of 2% and how countries need to hit 2% of defense spending. If every European country hit 2%, it would still not really alleviate the the military dependence on the United States. However, I do think that there's a need for the EU to begin to develop uh, common European public goods. Uh, and that includes investing in defense and key capabilities that the United States provides, the enabling capabilities, um, also in, in the energy transition, uh, but also in um, ensuring that Europe can, can act in the world. Um, you know, right now, for Ukraine, I mean, I think this is a wake up call to the Europeans, but wars are incredibly expensive. Uh, the United States was allocating $120 billion a year for Iraq and Afghanistan, $10 billion a month. Um, and wars are a big waste of money, but they happen. And then you need to find the fiscal capacity to do that. And I think that's one of the big challenges that, that we constantly see in Europe, but I'm looking straight at many of my, my German uh, friends. Uh, but that is, I think, will be a huge challenge that if the United States is not there, um, Europe will need to find the fiscal capacity to invest in not just defense, but other uh, major capabilities and other uh, to advance its foreign policy, advance its domestic interests. So that I think is uh, the, the other area that Europe needs to develop its, uh, its resilience. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for being so um, point on and giving us very tangible things to think about. And um, I didn't get to this question. Uh, someone in the audience asked, what about Biden 2.0? Um, but I leave the audience with the fact that, you know, even if Biden gets elected, so Trump is not a, obviously not a given, we are way too far ahead of the election to, to make any conclusion, conclusive calls on that. But even if Biden gets reelected, you know, the situation for the transatlantic relationship might not necessarily improve with a, a Republican dominated Congress. And we've seen sort of the, the shift from um, the more traditional bipartisan foreign policy making in Congress to a much more um, you know, extreme uh, approach and also a neglect, I guess, of, of Europe and not seeing the importance of this transatlantic alliance. Um, so yeah, a lot to think about. Um, thank you so much. For, to all of you for joining us. Um, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. Um, if you haven't read it yet, again, I'll plug Max, Max's piece. Um, it's in the chat. Read the policy brief. You will find a lot more in there. Um, and thank you again to Jana and Stephen for also joining us.